If you have a Bible, uh, would you open it up to Hebrews? It's towards the end of the scriptures. And as you uh, look to Hebrews, this is our uh, last part of the Advent uh, series that we've been in through the month of December. And we've gone way back to Genesis 3, whenever the curse came in, God had made everything perfect. Fast forwarded to 1 Samuel, where God gave a promise of a kingdom that would never end to David. Then we went from uh, that promise to Isaiah, where in Isaiah 7, we see uh, this proclamation of there will be a virgin who will have a baby and you will call his name Emmanuel. And he is God with us and he will take away the sins of his people. And then we looked at why was there such a gap between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament now we look at Hebrews. What happened after his uh, life, death, resurrection? What happened after that? Well, we're going to go through events of that through the Acts series. It starts next week. We're actually going to be there from January through the end of May, uh, really breaking apart that, that scripture and looking forward to it uh, very much. But tonight, uh, what happened after Jesus ascended? Where is he now? What is he doing? And tonight is called the exaltation. Now, I want to, as we go into this text, I want you to think about what you would get dressed up for. Now, I used to own lots and lots of really fancy clothes. In fact, in fifth grade, uh, I remember this distinctly, lived in Florida, and, and uh, I got my first B, and I was devastated. My first B. I wonder where my, my, some of my kids get this, like, drive that's, like, relentless, because I was like, a B? That's terrible. And then I had heard somewhere that if you dress up, that if you dress for success, you'll get more success. And somehow through my sixth grade year, I acquired about 76 ties. I wore a tie to school every single day in public school in Florida. And I was a pastor, I like to wear jeans, and that's about it, okay? And like around the house, it sweats and that. But what you think about, what do you get dressed up for? And it's like, well, well places where everything is put together, where everything is proper. Uh, 18 years ago, uh, today, my, my wife came in the back of a church single and, and left there married to me, stuck until death do us part, <laughs> Right? And I was telling people, we are officially adults today, marriage-wise. That, that means we got to act more grown up now moving forward. But that was a day of dressing up. That was a day where people came dressed up. It was a, it was a day of order. It was a day where, where people were like, they expect this to happen, and then this to happen, and then that to happen. And then when we went to the country club for our, for our reception, this was a time where we're going to celebrate. But there's still kind of order that was there, so long as there wasn't you know, too much dancing. That's why I limited it to three songs. That's it. That's it. What? It's not, I don't have any rhythm. I can't dance. Are you kidding me? Uh, it's not going to happen. And, and so at this time, we were, everything was in order. As we look in Hebrews, there's a picture here of Jesus being better than all creation. And as Jesus is better, it's, a, it's almost this place where we cannot fathom what it would be like, but it's a place of order. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. We have 66 books in the Bible. At the time that Hebrews was written, we don't know who wrote it. It could have been anyone, uh, of the, uh, anyone from Paul. Uh, some say it could be Peter. Some say it could be Timothy. Who knows who wrote it? But, but Hebrews was written to say, listen, Jesus is exalted above all things. And he is the one who's worthy of worship, and there is another like him, and there will never be any other like him. He is exalted above all. In all of the books in the Bible, we can trace uh, prophecies pointing to this coming Messiah, this one who will eventually reign. Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Now in Acts, God was not speaking through prophets, Acts, this is the, these are witnesses. This is what we're going to learn about next week. The prophets, uh, they stopped uh, earlier before those witnesses, before those apostles. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. His son is Jesus Christ, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Everything that was made in all the creation is coming back to Christ. You and I, older people, younger people, we will one day stand before Christ. Everything is coming back to him. Right now we are stewards 
of the things that he's blessed us with. We're stewards with the money that we have. We're stewards with the houses that we have. Most of us have one, but we're stewards with that. We're, we're stewards of the cars that we drive. We're stewards of the jobs we have or the education that we're in. We are stewards of the children and others who live in our home. We are stewards, and all things are coming back to Christ. He is the heir of all things. Through him, he also created the world. If Christ wasn't a part of creation, creation didn't happen. In verse 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That verse right there tells us so much about Christ. When we think about Christ, we think about the Messiah, the anointed one. That verse, he is the radiance of the glory of God. In translation, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. He is, he is holding all things together by the word of his power. He's the one that's holding life in his hands right now. It says, after making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, how did Christ make purification for our sin? And here's what I want you to hear. He made purification from our sin because he came into this world. He was already existing, but he came into this world. According to Philippians 2, he humbled himself. He took on flesh. He dwelt among us. He shows us the picture of full grace and full truth. He shows us the picture of perfect humanity of the way it should be and also what it means to be divine. As Christ came in, the Bible says that he was the Lamb of God. He was the one ultimately that was going to be slain for the purification of our sin. Way back in Leviticus, if there's not shedding of blood that is impossible for there to be forgiveness of sin. And so Jesus came as the perfect one who was going to be slain as a ransom, as a sacrifice for us. But how did he make purifications for sin? He went to the cross. And at the cross, he conquered the very curse of our sin. When his blood was shed, he says, declared victory over our sin, the wrath of God for all of his people, he took on himself. So there we have victory over sin. And then three days later, whenever he rose from the grave, he conquered death, the ultimate consequence of our sin. In this Christ, we have perfection and we also have victory. Victory over sin, victory over the grave. But after he made that purification for our sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Every time in scripture where we see the right hand of God the Father, that is a seat of authority. And the fact that he sat down tells us that it is finished. There is nothing that you and I can do to make ourselves cleaned up enough to present ourselves as worthy before the Lord on our own. It's not possible. So God, because of Christ, invites us into relationship with him simply because and boldly because of this Christ who made purification for it. When he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, a place of order, a place of power, a place of authority. And then it says, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Philippians 2 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what? That he is, that he is Lord. That he is Lord. The Father. So listen, you believe in Christ, we have nothing to fear. We will stand before him one day and, and we will bow before him and say, he is Lord over all. The name of Jesus all authority is there. And if you don't know him, if you have not come to place where place where you have put your faith in Christ, then you too will stand before him. And yes, you will acknowledge that he is Jesus, but no, you will not receive the inheritance. And this is a passage in scripture that we should look at with great hope, knowing that it's only by faith. If we say, Jesus, your work in your life, your work in your death, your work in your resurrection is enough, and I trust you. I place my faith in you. Then he is faithful, he is just, and he will purify us and make us new 
call us his own, say, welcome into the family. This is the gospel. You don't have to clean yourself up because you can't do it. You can't do it. None of us are holy. There is one that's holy. But he freely gives of himself and says, you are mine. Do you trust me? Have you placed your faith in me? Jesus right now is exalted at the right hand of the Father. And when we worship, when we stand, when we sing, we celebrate his reign and we celebrate his perfect rule. But to those who do not know Christ, to those who have not placed their faith in Christ, to those who are not walking as followers of Christ, then you do not receive the inheritance. And when you stand before him, it will be too late. Today is the day of salvation. Have you placed your faith in him? Do you trust him? I want to say to those who have placed their faith in Christ that this is something that we celebrate. To those who have not placed their faith in Christ, then what's holding you back? What's preventing you? And I say, oh, my, my sins are too big. His grace is more. My faith is too small. His grace is more. I, I just have to clean myself up. I need to stop doing these sins, X, Y, and Z. His grace is more. The Bible says when we were dead in our sin, Christ died for us. We were already strangers, aliens, corrupt under the curse, and yet he saved us only by his grace. And so to those who know, do not know Christ, I want to invite you to bow your head, pray with the rest of us, and would today be the day that you place your faith in him, the one and only exalted one. Let's pray together. God, you are holy and there's none like you. You are righteous and there is none like you. You are the God who saves. You are the God who, who makes us new. You are the God who is our rescuer, our redeemer, our deliverer, and you are with us by your spirit. God, give us a boldness for that. God, would you, in all your kindness and with all your mercy and all your grace, by the power of your spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, would you reach down to those here in this room right now who have not placed faith in you. They're still walking in their sins. They're still walking as, as people who are rebels, according to your word. But God, show them the way to your grace. Help them to place their faith in you tonight. To the young women, to the young men, to the older women, to the older men, to those all of different ages, different races, different backgrounds, different upbringings. God, you welcome us into a new kingdom, into a new family. And you say that we are yours and nothing can take us from you. So God, will we hold on to that tonight? It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray and ask all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.